Hello and welcome to module three of our introductory R programming course. Today we're talking about how to control the flow of your R program with if statements and for loops. And we'll also take the opportunity to talk about good programming style, which to us means using comments to make your code easier to follow and indentation and spacing to make your code easier to read for you and for others. Let's get started. Go ahead and fire up RStudio. And you're gonna to need to get a few things onto your computer. So in the description, I have links to um, these two files, flow and style comments, flow and flow and style code.r. In the video, I'll be working off of flow and style code.r. So we'll save this at the end of the video so you have a copy of it. But what I encourage you to do is to work off of uh, flow and style comments as you watch the video and type in the commands as you're watching the video yourself. That'll be a faster way for you to get uh, proficient at coding in R. Uh, so to do that, you'll need two screens. You'll need to have your laptop and another screen uh, such as a iPad or phone or a television screen. Okay, so get those two and go ahead and open up flow and style comments. It should look like this. And then you also need a data set. So the data set we'll be using is a data set of uh, alternative fuel stations uh, that comes from the Department of Energy. Uh, it was originally featured on a Tidy Tuesday blog. The link to that is here if you want to see what they did. And here are the links to get the data and also some information about uh, what's in the data set. This is called a data dictionary. So I'll have a link to both the .r file and the data set in the description. And go ahead and save the data set in your data sets directory. The file name is alt fuel stations 2023.08.07.csv. Uh, this date is just the date that I downloaded the file. So it's up to date as of that date. Okay, so pause and get that set up and then come back and we'll get going here. Okay, to read in the data, we're going to be using read.csv. So uh, I'm going to title my variable EV because this data set only has electric vehicle charging stations in it. Uh, read.csv. Uh, we need to check which directory we're in to know how to get to the data set. So I went ahead and set my working directory to the video code. It's good practice to set your working directory to the directory that contains the script that you're working on. Uh, but to verify that we're in there, we'll do get working directory. And I know from my, uh, data, uh, my directory structure that to get to data sets, if I'm in video code, to get to data sets, I have to go up one into intro R and then down into data sets. So read.csv dot dot to go up one down into data sets and then I'll just type alt and hit tab and that will complete it for me. All right, so it's a big data set. Uh, let's take a look at it. The first thing I usually do is str on the data frame. And we get this. So you can see there's lots of variables there, but at the very top it says ev is a data frame. 58,000 observations of 73 variables, and then it lists out all the different variables. So there's a mix of characters, logicals, which we learned about last time, integers, numerics, so on and so forth. To get a peek at the first few rows of data, we'll say head and here's what it looks like. Lots and lots of data. Uh, there's a fuel type code. This is always going to be electric, as we'll see. There's a station name, street address, uh, some information about the intersection, city, state, zip. If there's a phone number associated with it, all kinds of information. Each row corresponds to a single electric vehicle charging station. Okay, we already saw this in STR, but we can look at the number of rows, 
58,820. Number of columns, 73. And we can also get that information using the dim function. Okay, let's get my face out of the way and make this as big as possible because this is a huge data set with many columns and we're going to want to look at it. So your boss gives you this data set, tells you to do something with it, and you get it on your computer and you start looking at it and it's this huge thing. The first thing you should really do when you get a data set and you have a project to do with the data set is to try to find some way to look at the data to understand what you're working with. So that's what we're going to do here today. And we're going to, to do that, we're going to need to use uh, some loops and if statements. So we'll show you how that works in the process. Okay, so we're going to try to get a handle on this data set. Let's look at the names of the columns. So names EV prints out the columns names. You can see that uh, names EV returns a character vector with the column names. And you can see that, that the length of that character vector is 73, which of course matches the number of columns. So here are all the variable names. Uh, so we want to just kind of start looking at this thing. So uh, fuel type code is the first one. So if you wanted to see, okay, what are the uh, different values of fuel type code, you can use the table function. Uh, so we'll give it EV dollar fuel type code. So once that shows up, we can hit tab. What this is going to return is a little table that has all the possible values of fuel type code and the number of times each value appears. So this one's really simple. There's only one value that ever appears in fuel type code and it's ELEC and it's in every single one. That's because when I downloaded the data set, I only selected electric vehicle charging stations. So that's not surprising. So that's not such an interesting variable. We can move on. Uh, the second one was station name. So let's take a look at that. We could do the same thing. Again, this is going to return a named vector. Ooh, and now there's a lot of them. Okay, so this is giving us very specific information about each station. All right, so maybe we don't want to print a table out, um, but we could try to figure out how many unique uh, station names are there. There's a few ways to do that. So first thing we could do, we could just look at the length of this table. Since there's an element for each unique value. Uh, we just look at the length of it. It'll tell us the number of unique values. 56,000. So nearly one for every row of the data. A few are repeated or possibly missing. Uh, we could also do that. There's a function called unique. So if we do unique EV dollar station name, that returns, let me just run that. So if you wanted to run just part of a line, you can highlight it. And to highlight, again, I want to uh, focus on telling you some of these keyboard shortcuts because it's a good idea to not have to go to the mouse. So what I'm doing to highlight is shift. I put the cursor here, shift, right arrow, and keep going until I reach the end. And from here, I can do control enter and it will just run the highlighted part. On your computer, it may be Command Enter if you're using a Mac. Of course, you'll have to go to see this keyboard shortcuts. You go into the uh, Tools menu and click Keyboard Shortcuts Help or Alt Shift K. It brings up something like this. Okay, so this is these are all the different station names, um, and another way of getting the number of them would be to do length unique. Okay, this is interesting. So you can see what happened here. It didn't complete the command. It just has a plus here. When it does that, that means R is waiting for more input. And the reason it's waiting for more input is that I didn't complete the parentheses for this length function. So there's two ways of getting out of it. I could type the parentheses and hit enter and that should finish it. Um, 
I could do escape and that will get out of it. And then I do control one to get back over here and finish off this and run it like that. Okay, so that's just another, another way of seeing the number of unique station names. Uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, we'll do names EV. And I don't want to print them all out again because we're just going to look at the first few. So I'm going to do names EV 1 to 10. So this is kind of interesting. Um, you can stack these operations on top of each other. So we've, we've seen things like this, uh, let's say, just get six random normals. And we've seen things like this to grab the first four. Uh, you can do this all in one shot uh, without having to save an intermediate variable name by just putting the square brackets at the end. So this is perfectly allowable. Okay. All right, so these are the first 10. Let's look at street address. Uh, okay, S table ev dollar street address. Of course, there's going to be too many of these. So let, maybe I'll just print the first 10. All right, so um, this is kind of interesting. There's 33 entries where it's there's a blank names. It's actually not blank. What they're telling you here is that, actually, can we do this? Um, all right, let's see if we can do this. So names of the table will extract the names. And I just want to look at the first one. So that should give it to us. What this actually is, is an empty character string. That's what that thing is. It's different from this. So this will return false. So a space actually is something which is different from just an empty character string. Okay, good to know. So this just means it was empty in the data set. All right, but the rest are kind of uh, just unique street addresses. Um, if we wanted to look, we saw this last time, we can see how many are missing. Is.na ev dollar street address. So this is going to return a logical vector, the same length as uh, ev dollar street address. We don't want to print that whole thing out, but we want to count the number of missing values. And it's zero. So this is kind of interesting. So it seems that they're using an empty string as their missing value indicator. Um, so that may be something we want to clean up in the data uh, later on down the line. Okay, let's do one more. The next one was uh, intersection directions. So it might not be too interesting. Let's do city because that's more interesting. Table EV dollar city. Okay, again, there's a lot of them. So let's just look at the first 10. And you can see what it's doing here is it's listing them out in alphabetical order, but maybe that's not so interesting. We want to see the, the most common cities. So the way you do that is you just run sort on table. So let's do sort table EV dollar city. So this is the entire table. We're going to sort it and then grab the first 10 entries from the sorted table. And OK, that didn't do what we expected it to do. So this is a good learning experience. So sort didn't give us the most common ones. So let's do question mark sort to see what's going on. It will pull up the help file. And let's read the description. Sort or order a vector or factor partially into ascending or descending order. For ordering along more than one variable, blah, 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 see order. OK, here's the usage. You give it an input, x, and then, oh, OK, this is interesting. There's a decreasing argument, which by default is set to false. So by default, it's in increasing order. And we want decreasing order because we want to see the most common city. So we can amend our call 
So you got to be careful about where you put the argument. So table EV dollar city is the thing we're going to sort. So we'll close that off and say decreasing equals true. And then we'll grab the first 10. And now this is more interesting. Here you can see that uh, there's 1,651 in LA, 739 in San Diego. Wow, a lot of uh, California cities here. Okay, so that's how you take a peek at some of the data. As you can see, this is getting to be a bit tedious to go through every single variable. It's worth doing, uh, but we can go a bit faster because we have a computer. So what we're going to do here next is to write some R code to loop over all the different columns and print information out about each column. To do that, we're going to use something called a for loop. So let's go over the basic syntax of a for loop. And here it is. For, that's easy. J in 110, just to give you an example, print J. I'm just going to write the whole thing out and then go over the different parts. So to invoke a for loop, you use the for function. And inside in the argument, you do this kind of funny looking thing. You have J, this is called the looping variable or indexing variable. And then you separate by space and then use the keyword in. And then you give a vector. Close the for loop and then open up what's called an expression, which is any code that sits inside of these curly brackets. Okay, so this is the basic syntax for a for loop. And what will happen here is it will iterate the value of j over this vector 1 through 10. So the, in the first iteration, j is going to be equal to 1, which is the first value here. It's going to run the code that's inside the expression. When it gets to the end, it starts over, but then it increments j to the second value in this vector, which is 2, runs the code, finishes, goes back to the top, iterates on j, so on and so forth. So let's just see what happens. If we run, so, okay, another thing, to run uh, this whole set of code, I can highlight the whole thing. To do the highlight, I'm doing shift and then down and control enter. That's printing it out. I believe you can also just, when you're working with a loop, you can just do control enter at the top. That works too. It'll run the whole thing. Okay, so you can see what it did. It printed out one, finished the expression, went back to the top, it printed out two, three, four, up through 10. Okay, so that's not too complicated. It's one of those things that sounds kind of scary, but that's all it is. If you want to see documentation for the for loop, uh, let's see, does this work? Does not work. Um, the documentation is in here. Question mark, capital control. And this has documentation for if statements, which we'll cover next. For loops, uh, while loops, which we're not going to cover today and then some special um, actions that can uh, happen inside of for loops. All right, let's see another example here. Uh, we'll say x is some vector. Just putting some numbers in. y is I'm going to initialize it as an empty vector or a vector with NAs. That's the same length of x. And what we're going to put in y is x squared. So each value of x, we're going to square it and put it in the corresponding uh, index for y. So we could do that with a for loop. For j in 1 to the length x y of j, so we're setting the jth element of y to be the jth element of x squared. Okay, so that's the syntax. 
Here we're just running one line as before. We'll see examples down below where you can do, you can have multiple lines that you run inside of the expression, but this is we're just starting simple here. Uh, let's run, let's maximize space here so we can see what's going on. We'll run this line to define x, initialize y, and run that there. And then we could print out x and y. So it did what we asked it to do. Um, you can see that since these are longer, they don't get printed out directly below the x. So let's see how we can put them together to make it look nice. You might try to do this. Uh, but what that's going to do is append y to the end of x. So that doesn't really give you the correspondence that you want. The command you're looking for is cbind x comma y. So that puts them right next to each other. And you can see that uh, 4 squared is 16, 2 squared is 4, 9 squared is 81, so on and so forth. A uh, little quiz, what kind of object gets returned by C bind here. Pause. You can pause and think about it. That object is a matrix, and its columns are named x and y because those are the names of the variables we gave to it. You can tell it's a matrix because it's printed out in an array like this, and it has these square bracket one comma for the first row, two comma for the second row, so on and so forth. So just to verify that, we can say class c by x y is a matrix. Uh, what happens, I'm just curious, and you should be doing this kind of thing. Uh, as you're watching the video and typing out commands, you'll, things are going to pop in your head, like what would happen if I did this? Um, so you should just pause the video, do it, and learn something. I'm curious what happens if you do c bind x, whether it returns a vector or a matrix. So you can see it returns a matrix. So that's kind of a convenient way to convert your vectors to a, here in this case, a six by one matrix, if you needed to do such a thing. Okay, that's how a for loop works. And let's put it to work on our project of figuring out what's in this data set. So the strategy here is we're gonna write a for loop for j in one up to the number of columns of our EV data set. And we're gonna to need to know which variable we're looking at. So the first thing I'm gonna do is print the jth name of the, DV, uh, of the data frame. So names EV returns the column names of the data frame. And I'm doing this compound operation where I get names and then I grab the jth one of the result. And then let's just do what we were doing before. So we want to look at the table of the data from the jth column, but we want to sort that table and make sure it's decreasing that closes sort. By the way, when I close this, this thing gets highlighted in gray here, so you can see which parentheses are closing. That's really useful. Uh, but yeah, decreasing equals true. We have to finish that. Uh, close, and let's just grab the first four and close our expression. So here's an example of a for loop that, up, that evaluates two lines within the loop. So when j equals 1, it's going to evaluate this, and then this, and then go back to the top. Oh, by the way, let me run this. OK, I'm going to do an intermediate step here. Before, we didn't use these print statements. If you go back up to the code. We just type table EV city, uh, sort table EV city, and that printed things out to the console. That won't work if you're inside of a for loop. For whatever reason, R doesn't print out, print things out inside of a for loop when you just write them like this. So what you have to do is surround 
whatever you want to print inside of print. And that will print them out. All right, let's run that. That ran just that line. Uh, let's see, if I put the cursor here and do Control Enter, then it runs the whole loop. Okay, let's scroll through all this stuff all the way to the top and take a look at what it printed. Okay, first one is the fuel type code. All of them were electric. And what happened here is it printed out, this is interesting, uh, three NAs after that. So let's, let's uh, show you what's going on there. So if I make a vector, uh, let's just say B equals 3.2, and let's make it a legitimate vector, 3.2 and 5. Not that a length one vector is not legitimate, but two is interesting. If we try to grab the first element, we get 3.2. If we try to grab the second element, we get 5. But if we try to grab the third element, there is no third element, so it's going to give us an NA. So if we were to say B of 1 to 4, it gives 3.25 NA NA. That's exactly what's going on here. The result of table EVJ is a length one vector because there's only one uh, fuel type code, electric. And when I try to grab the first four elements, it complains and said, there's no elements there, so I'm just going to give you NA. So that's what's getting printed out. Station name. Uh, you can see the most common station name is Wawa Tesla Supercharger. So I guess apparently there are 135 Tesla Superchargers at Wawa's in this data set. Wawa is leading the way over Sheets, which has 70, Target, which has 60, and Meyer or Miger, uh, which has 65. Uh, let me know what the right pronunciation of that is. I think it's Meyer. Um, street address, uh, apparently there's 81 rows that are at 1201 Pine Street. That would be something interesting to investigate what the heck is going on there. Uh, 79 at 2910 Tannery Way. Uh, apparently Facebook has 58. Uh, intersection directions, we see again that the, this is an empty string, so most of the intersection directions are actually there's nothing there. Um, I don't know what this means. Maybe this means it's on the left side of the road, but don't know. Something to investigate. Uh, we saw before Los Angeles is the most common. California by far is the most common. Uh, there are the most common zip codes. Um, plus four. I don't know what that means. Phone number. Uh, here's the most common phone numbers. 31, most of them have this phone number. That's pretty interesting. Um, I don't know. We should call that number and see who's there. Uh, status code is E, probably for electric, so on and so forth. Oh, this one's interesting. Groups with access code, public-private. I guess most of these are public charging stations, but there are some private ones. All right, and you can... When you run this, you can scroll through and look at everything. But this was a lot more efficient than trying to go through every single variable like we did above, typing them out. And, you know, first of all, you have to type, you figure out what the variable names are and type them all out. As opposed to this four lines of a for loop, it does everything for us. Up until now, all of the for loops have. Well, we've used J for the variable name. That can be anything, uh, but what has to happen is the when you access it, obviously the variable used to access has to match here. So that's one thing we've always done. The other thing we've always done is the, the looping vector has always been one up to some number, like one up to n call ev, one up to length x, or one to 10 as before. But the looping vector really can be any vector, and you can use any name that makes sense for the looping variable. So let's rewrite this for loop above in a way that's maybe a, a little bit cleaner. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna loop over the names of the EV data set. So I'm gonna 
my looping vector and call it nm to stand for name in names ev. And what I'll do is just print name directly. And then I'll print the same thing here. I'll type this thing out, ev name. Let's leave those spaces out. Okay, so we've done this a little bit different. We're looping over the name, the column names of EV, the looping variable. In the spirit of choosing good variable names, I'm, instead of calling it J, I'm calling it NM to stand for name. We're gonna print that thing out. So this is a bit cleaner because we don't have to each time figure out the names and then grab the Jth element. And this is also, well, this is, Maybe nicer, maybe not, that's fine. Uh, so this code will do the same thing. And then as you noticed, I'll add one more little bell and whistle. Um, it's sometimes kind of hard to see when the new variable starts. Um, so I'm gonna do, I'm gonna use the cat function. So what cat does is it, um, it's sort of like print, uh, but it won't include um, this stuff, like the bracket one and forward slash n forward slash n or is that a backslash i can never remember that slash will give a two new lines so you can see what gets printed here is there's space between them let me go to the top so it printed out the first name field type code so that's the first element of names EV, and it printed that out. Then it printed the table, that's this here, and then two fresh new lines. So most of the time you'll be using for loops like this where you're looping over one up to some number. The reason the most of the time you're doing that is because you're doing things like this up here where you're, you're taking some input vector and you're grabbing the jth element and then modifying the jth element of some other vector or data frame or matrix or something like that. But this is to show you that you can use any vector as the looping variable and at times this can make your code a little bit cleaner. Okay, next topic is conditional statements, the if else statements. So let's give the basic syntax first. Uh, I'm gonna make a variable called x which is equal to the logical true and I'm gonna write my first if statement. If x, so the syntax is if, is a, which is a function, uh, inside you put the logical vector or logical value, open an expression, and say print x is true. Close the expression. All right, so what's going on here? The if function takes in a single logical value as its argument, and if that logical value is true, it evaluates the stuff inside of the expression. So since x is true here, when we run this, it's going to print x is true. Okay, now if x were false, it simply won't run the command. So nothing gets printed out here because this part did not get evaluated. Um, so in this case, since we're only doing one line in the expression, you can actually make this more compact and say, and remove the curly brackets. Well, there's different ways you could do it. You could put the curly brackets here That's perfectly fine. So this will work. And you can also remove the curly brackets, but only if it's one single uh, line that you're running. So this, this is perfectly fine. Okay, 
Um, you can also add an otherwise statement or an else statement. So let me show you how that works. So we're gonna start again, if x print x is true, and then close our expression, space else, space open a new expression. So what's gonna go in this new expression is what happens if x is not true. And I guess we should print x is false. Close that. All right, so here's the syntax. If x, we run this part, close expression, else or otherwise, run this expression. So let's set, show you what happens here. x is true, runs the first one. If we were to set it to false, it'll run the second one. Okay, very simple. The only hard part about this is trying to just remember what the syntax is, but you'll just you'll get that with practice. And again, you should be typing this in yourself as you're watching the video. Uh, that will give you kind of the muscle memory in your fingers to remember how to do it. Uh, this also you can do on one line. So I could, if I really wanted to save space, do this. And this should work perfectly fine. Here, x is still false, so it prints false. Uh, by the way, uh, one thing, if you're using this particular color scheme in RStudio, um, well, most of the color scheme do do this, but you can see that the word else is printed in a different color. Uh, another example is in is printed in a different color, for is in a different color, and if is in a different color. That's because R knows that, or R Studio knows that these are special variables, and you should not ever define a variable called else. Let's see what happens. Um, actually, it won't even let you do it. So there's a few variable names that are reserved as special variables or special set of characters that are not allowed as variable names. Probably if you can't do. Yeah, you can't do that. Okay, uh, so that's why they're getting printed out because they're special. All right, now the next thing you could do is here, this is just kind of a, a binary statement. If this, then do this, otherwise do that. So there's only two options. But you, you can actually stack these on top of each other with else if functions. So um, one thing, or here's one reason you might want to do that in this case. If we were to say x is na and we run this, we get an error. So error in if x missing value or true false needed. So that is telling us that in this if statement, it's expecting either a true or a false and a missing value, it doesn't know what to do with that, and so it throws an error. So we can handle that exception with uh, by adding a else if. So we can say if is.nax, we'll do something, print x is uh, na, else if, so it's space elf space if, x, so that's if x is true, we'll do print x is true. And then if that all fails, we print x is false. All right, so let's review this. If it's missing, so what gets returned here, here, let's, let's uh, step through this. X right now is na. So is.nax returns true. So what's gonna happen when we run this, this is gonna be true. In that case, it's gonna print this and be done because it won't evaluate the otherwise conditions. Uh, but if, if this evaluates to false, uh, then it will skip this. It will go to this else, evaluate this if. If that evaluates to true, it will print this. 
If this evaluates to false, then it will print this. So let's run that. In this case, it should print X is NA, and we get that. But let's run through all the cases. X is NA, good, true, good, false, good. Okay, so you can do a single if with no else condition. And if this is false, it just skips it and moves on to the next line of your code. You can have an else condition. So that's what to do when this is false. And you can also do else ifs. And you can, you can do many of these. You could do 10 else ifs if you want to. Um, and it will have different conditions for different things. Now let's put our newly found knowledge about if else to work and printing out information about our data frame. If we scroll all the way up back to where these were printed out before, uh, we're using table to print out information, but sometimes table doesn't make sense. Uh, let's find an example. Okay, here's a good one. Latitude and longitude. So there's 28 instances of latitude 37.875902. But since this is a numeric variable, it doesn't really make sense to list out the most common. Well, maybe it makes sense. Uh, this is kind of interesting. There's 28 at the same spot. But probably a more meaningful summary would be to do you know, some kind of five, nine, five number summary giving uh, information about the mean and median and so on and so forth. So what we're going to do is when we loop over our variable names or the columns of EV, we're going to check whether it's numeric or character and do something different depending on uh, which variable type it is. So let's grab our loop so that we don't have to do things over again. And we'll just paste it in here. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll say print, always print the name out, but if is dot character ev name, we're going to do something. Actually, we're going to do this, so let's just do that. And we'll do an else if is dot numeric. We're going to print five number summary. Show you what that looks like. And then otherwise, we're going to print something out. Uh, let's just say neither character nor numeric. So don't print anything out. Well, print that out, but don't print any information about the variable. Okay, so let's take a look here. So we'll print the name. If it's a character, we do that. If it's numeric, other, sorry, otherwise, if it's numeric, we'll do this. And otherwise, we print that thing. Now, whenever you're doing any kind of programming, there's going to be multiple ways to do things. So I'm using is.character to check whether this column is a character vector. You could do something like um, uh, well let me let me type it in there. Type of ev name equals equals character. Actually, let's double check that type of ev first column is character yeah so this is a you know equivalent way to do it so what gets evaluated here it uses the type of function to figure out the type of that column does a comparison with the double equals operator to the value character 
If this is equal to character, this will evaluate to true. If it's not, it will evaluate to false and then skip. So you may, may decide that you'd rather write the code like that. I prefer uh, this way because it's a little bit shorter. And this is.character is really designed to detect character. So I prefer it that way. But again, there's different ways to do things, and you may prefer it a different way. All right, so if we run this, um, now we get this. So it looks mostly the same, but it's a little bit cleaner. Like, for example, I think what's going on with this one is it's always missing. And when it's always missing, it actually defaults to logical. Um, so it's neither character nor numeric. Uh, something like, let me find it, federal agency ID. Now maybe this is a mistake, and I this this federal agency ID is a number, but it's not a number in the sense that one is closer to two than it is to ten. So maybe five number summary doesn't make sense for that, uh, but it does for something like latitude and longitude. You can see what they are. Okay, so maybe we prefer this this printout um, for our data. Okay, so that's how to control the flow of your R script using for loops and if statements and if else statements. There are a few other topics you might find interesting. So for example, we didn't cover while loops. Um, while loops are important, but honestly, I don't use them that much. Uh, I prefer the for loop. Um, but you can read all about that other stuff inside of question mark control. While is documented. And you may find interesting to read about uh, break and next. These are things um, used from time to time. What break does is it, if you're running through your for loop and some condition happens, you can tell the code to exit the for loop and not continue iterating. And next is similar, but it just skips the current one and moves to the next one. So you may find applications where the, you may need to use those. And to find out the documentation, you do question mark control. Now, moving on to style. So I've highlighted three elements of style. And the, really, the purpose of all these three elements is to make your code easy to read. So the most important thing is that your code is right, of course. You want it to do the right calculations. But that's not really enough. You want to be able to, at some point in the future, come back to your code and understand what it's doing you'll find that it's surprising if you go away for a couple months and come back you'll find it's surprisingly difficult to get back into your own head and understand why you did the things you did in your code um, so that's one element of one reason for why style is important another one is if you want to share it with someone else of course they can't be inside your head so you have to communicate to them somehow what you're doing uh, so I, I'm highlighting three elements. The first is picking good variable names. The general rule is that they should be as short as possible, but informative. Short because it makes the code more compact and concise, which contributes to being easy to read. But if it's too short and, and so short that it's not informative, then that kind of defeats the purpose of having a variable name. Um, comments can be really helpful. Again, you can strike a balance. So comments should be enough to describe what you're doing. If there's something as you're writing the code and something unexpected was unexpected to you, maybe write a comment about that and why you made the decision you did to um, get around the problem. But of course, you don't want to to do too much. Um, and then the last thing is just in general, kind of lining things up to uh, indicate things with the code. We'll see examples for this uh, in a second. Okay, so let's start with indentation. And we're going to take our last example to show you something interesting, I think. All right, so if we stare at this, you can see that uh, what I've done is I've indented. In this case, I'm using a tab. Some people like to use, instead of a tab, four spaces. I think by default, 
uh, like if you hit enter here, it will automatically insert a tab because our studio knows that you're inside of a for loop. I believe you can change uh, that option so that it inserts a four spaces instead of a tab. Um, but these are all indented to indicate that we are inside of a for loop. The code will run just fine if you remove these indentations. This is no problem. It's not like Python where the indentations are required. Um, it will work without them. Uh, but the reason for doing it is to indicate to whoever's looking at your code that we're inside a for loop for all this code. Because sometimes your for loop can be really long, like it'll extend beyond the page. Um, in that case, it, indentation really helps to understand where you are inside the nested. Sometimes you have a for loop inside of a for loop, or in this case, we have if statements inside of for, for loops. When we invoke the if statements, we did an indentation again to say that here in this line, we're inside this if statement. And it's two indentations because this if statement is inside this for loop. Okay, so that's one thing, indentation. And let me show you um, one more thing. So this syntax is a little bit odd, in my opinion, that what's going on here is we close this one, we do an else and then a space. But if we, for, so first of all, you could take any piece of code and enclose it in curly braces. So let's enclose, uh, this piece of code and it will work just fine. So this still works, no errors at the end. But the reason I'm doing that is because what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add indentation like this. And I think if you do it this way, you can kind of understand what, um, how R is implementing the else if statement. So here, now it looks like, okay, we have one if condition, it evaluates this. Otherwise, it evaluates this whole thing. And what happens in this whole thing is there's another if statement, and then an else, an else statement. So this happens if this if statement doesn't evaluate. So this is the exact same code. I've, I've added only two curly braces. But like I said, you can add curly braces anywhere in it. It shouldn't, um, it shouldn't impact the code. Uh, well, okay, there is an exception to that. If, for example, if you add like a curly brace inside of a loop and then outside of a loop, that's gonna cause problems, so don't do that. Uh, but if you stay you know, within the same place, it shouldn't cause a problem. Okay, so this, this is just, all I've done here is I've used indentation to somewhat explain visually how R implements if else, which I thought was kind of interesting. Okay, next thing I wanna show you are comments. As you know, and you've seen many times, uh, comments are indicated by putting a pound sign or hashtag, and then you can write whatever you want after it. Um, so the idea here is to keep them short and informative. So here you might say something like, we're gonna loop over all the column names in the EV data set. So that's giving some information about what we're about to do. And it's also reminding us that EV is a data set and maybe I should write a data frame. So that tells us, that reminds us that EV is a data frame. Um, here, you probably don't need to put a comment here. Uh, so you could say like print the column name. But that's, in my opinion, a bit overkill. We know already that name is the, the looping variable and names EV are the column names for EV and it's right next to it. Maybe if it was much further down, we would put a comment, but this is so close that maybe we'll just not put a comment there. Um, and then here's this big block of code. Um, and actually, let me revert this because 
I actually do prefer the syntax where you don't do all this extra indentation. Most people prefer to write their else ifs like this because there's you know really no, it's not confusing. You can see this happens. Otherwise, you try this and do this. Otherwise, you do this. Okay, but this is a big block of code, so maybe it makes sense to do a comment to say what we're about to do in this block of code. So I'm going to write print different information depending on column type. So that tells us that we're going to look at the column type and print something different depending on what the column type is. And we might say, okay, if this is a pretty long line. So as opposed to this, this is simple. We're printing a name, but there's a lot happening in this line. So we, we might just explain in words what's going on there. If character print the four most common values. This is a lot easier to read and understand what's going on. You can read this and understand what's going on. You kind of work from the inside out and say, okay, we're doing a table of the thing. We're going to sort it, but in decreasing order, and then we're going to look at the first four and print them out, uh, which is possible to do. I'm not saying it's not possible to understand what's going on in this line, but it's a, more confusing than this, and therefore maybe it's, it makes sense to have a comment here. Um, we'll also put a comment here. Oh. So if numeric print a five number summary, this maybe you could argue is less necessary, but that's what that is. Um, this maybe is just a, uh, a matter of a opinion, subjective opinion, but it's kind of a it's kind of symmetric to have a comment there and then what happens and a comment there and then what happens. Probably here you don't need a comment because it's telling you exactly <laughs> what's getting printed there. So you probably don't need to say like, if otherwise print neither character nor merrick because it says it right there. So you probably don't need a comment. So that's what I mean by give comments where they're useful, and where they uh, reduce uh, misunderstanding or ambiguity. But don't go overboard. You really don't need a comment for that, and you don't need a comment for that. All right, the last thing I want to talk about is adding optional white space to improve the readability of your code. So I'm just copying our for loop, and we're going to edit the code without changing the functionality, but make it a little bit easier to read. So for example, if you look at this, big block of code. I don't know about you, but my eyes get a little bit overwhelmed looking at this because everything is kind of bunched together. So what I'll often do, if it's not too, uh, if it doesn't take up too much space, I'll just put spaces here, an extra enter. And that makes it a little bit easier to read. So here's, let me put a space here. So this is the whole the whole for loop with all the comments. And you may prefer this. This is a little bit easier to read because it doesn't really overwhelm your eyes by everything being bunched together. It's easy to parse out what the different parts are doing. Again, this is a matter of personal preference, but for me, this is easier to read. You may also consider if you have a long line like this one, breaking up the operations into multiple lines to make it easier to parse. So we can do, let's just evaluate the table first. And then we can replace this thing with the variable tab. And perhaps this is easier to read. And so I made a decision about what I was going to take out of this line and put here. I could have gone further and said, well, I'm going to go ahead and sort it. And 
And then here I would just put tab. But I feel like that kind of defeats the purpose of splitting things up because now everything is just on this line instead of this line, almost everything. So I would probably prefer to do this without the sort. So now I know tab, I'm creating a table and then I'm sorting that table with the decreasing argument set to true and grabbing the first four. You might decide that you want another variable sorted tab. And then here you would just put sorted tab one to four. Maybe prefer that. Again, this is going to be a matter of personal preference. Um, but doing things like this to split things up can make your code easier to read because I don't have to evaluate this entire long line up here and parse things out one at a time to know what's going on. It kind of splits it up into digestible parts. Okay, that's it for today. Thanks for sticking with it. Now you know how to use if statements, if else statements, and for loops to control the flow of your R program. And you're also going to be writing much nicer code that uses comments, indentation, and spacing to make your code easy to read for you and for others. We'll see you next time.